Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Today on the Focus on Why podcast, I am joined by Martin Morrison. Martin, welcome. Hello, Amy. How are you doing? I'm very well, thanks. I'm looking forward to you sharing some truths and some the journey you've been on with the audience because it's going to be quite a packed interview this one. Uh, well, I'm looking forward to doing it because what I find is whenever um, I'm asked these questions, it gives me an opportunity to reflect. And I realise that sometimes the narrative has changed slightly since the last time. Um, and I think that that's an important part of my message for anybody is that we should be like a drop of water going down the window pane. Um, at any point, we're evolving and growing and we could change direction or discover something new about ourselves. I love that analogy. I love and I love watching the rain, the way it sort of joins up with the other droplets and then sort of zooms across in different directions and then slows down. It's a great analogy, actually. So share with us where it all started. What is it you're doing now and why you're doing it? Three big questions that you don't need to answer all at once. OK, no, the, the where it all started one is tricky um, because I could say, well, you know, let me say, I'll, I'll start with what I'm doing now. That's probably easier. Um, these days, I'm a professional ghostwriter and editor primarily. OK, um, the way I work is very intuitive. So, for example, if I'm 100 percent ghostwriting for somebody, I will have a chat with them and bring out their truth but I'm very good at reading between the lines. So they might be able to tell me the nuts and bolts of what they did, but they might not be as articulate when it comes to describing the thought processes and feelings and um, you know pressures that got them to that particular point in their lives. And I'm very good at, at seeing the unseen. So I'm from an editorial point of view, and um, when it comes to proofing and editing, it's more a case of me recognizing patterns and flow and seeing that um, there's a blind spot in the way that they're telling their story or the, the sequence of events, the way they've described it. I'm struggling with it and I know that somebody else will, so I'll turn it around to make it so that it's got a really nice flow to it. Um, as well as the writing and editing, I'm also a professional speaker. I would probably say anybody that's known me throughout my life especially since being a kid would probably think that I was more likely to be a speaker than a writer because I was never a bookworm but the, what ties those two things together is I'm an ideas person I you know in the same way that I described the water drop I see connections between things and I, I like linking ideas I've got a very philosophical mindset which, as you'll find in the podcast as we go on, um, there was a number of reasons why, with my life, it was either die or become philosophical. Um, so these days, I use whatever stories have happened to me in my life or whatever I, I'm experiencing now to deliver inspirational messages if you like and that's my way of expressing my truth with clarity which is my slogan and what I'm really keen to do whether I'm writing whether I'm editing somebody else's work or whether I'm speaking is not only to express my truth with clarity but to facilitate the process of somebody else expressing their truth with clarity and that brings me to the final thing that I do um, I mean, I do lots of things, but these are the three main ones. I'm also a radio presenter. My show is called The Culture Pot on Radio Sangam, which is the UK's most followed Asian radio station. And it was a weird one, this, Amy. I, I don't want to splice, the, you know, we can probably talk about that story, how that happened later. But I, I was very aware that I was taking 
another radio seat, a radio presenter's seat from an Asian person on an Asian radio station. And therefore, I felt a lot of pressure as a, as a white man to earn that seat by doing something that was, you know, that had value. So the culture part celebrates the music, the culture and the people of the world. And I talk to people and find out about their lives, their childhood, their cultural background and all the rest of it. But I must admit, over time, the way that show has evolved has become a little bit more like a journeying show. So I'll bring people on and we go right back to childhood, take them through their lives as their, if you like, psychological or spiritual position becomes increasingly untenable because they're not living the life that they want to live until they get sucked through the black hole of transformation and they come out on the other side as self-actualized or spiritually fulfilled, however you want to put it, people. And so I'm helping them to express their truth with clarity. There is one more thing that I do, and I know it sounds mental, but if I'm going to express my truth with clarity, Amy, that means no holds barred. If I want to do something, I do it. Otherwise, I wouldn't be self-employed. I teach martial arts, but it's, it's primarily one-to-one, um, although I do have a free Tai Chi class as well. But again, there's teaching martial arts and there's teaching martial arts with a view to helping people to express themselves, helping people to find their truth. And I'm very old school. I try to offer a Mr. Miyagi experience, if you like. So somebody who comes to me to learn martial arts, I usually find that what's attracted them to me is something deeper, that maybe they were going through some kind of issue. Maybe they wanted to be more confident or they wanted to work through something. And so it's therapy through the back door. And we go on a journey, which is mental, physical, and spiritual. So that's who I am. That's what I do. Where it all started, it's always starting, right? As I said before, because we are always open to experience. But these days, I'm a lot more intuitive and in touch with who I really am. And I'm already on the journey. So I'm going to highlight two main starting points, right? Um, The most recent starting point was 10 years ago when I was still working in my, um, I was still in the middle of my 15 year career in advertising sales. And I was anything but happy and anything but fulfilled. And I realized that I had all kinds of skills to bring to the table as a self-employed person. In fact, going back as far as 2005, I had already predicted some of the things that I'm doing now, but I was unable to move on them. I was unable to make them happy because I had a mental program going on that said, you are not lovable. You are not worthy. You cannot succeed. And I identified that in 2000 and it was 2009 or 2010 when somebody who I considered as being like a father in my life, not my literal father, not my my blood father, it was my best friend's dad, turned around and said to me, Martin, I don't think your father ever told you that he loved you. And I I went into floods of tears. I I it was like op- I, I, something had opened up. I, it was just an abyss of pain that came out, and it was so simple and it was so true. And I realized that despite having a, a very strong warrior spirit and very resilient mentality and having got through so much, I was still damaged from the second start which was, well, actually the first, my childhood, which I'm going to take you back to, that this program needs to be fixed. And that was when I embarked on a program of mental reprogramming. That was 10 years ago. And since then, I evolved from being an advertising salesman that was very unhappy, that was failing in everything. I was absolutely average at everything. Let's just say that, including my relationships to where I am today. 
you know, every, uh, you know, I'm not a millionaire, but I'm very happy. Everything I do, I'm happy with. So I'm going to take you back to the real start. Okay. So I was one of seven kids. Um, I grew up in the 70s in a very tough environment, a place called Toxted in Liverpool. And it was quite a paradoxical upbringing because we were raised as extremely strong Catholics. So even when you walked in through the vestibule, by the time you'd come into the main hall, you'd already walked underneath a statue of Joseph holding the baby Jesus. Thinking back on it, I've always felt as though it was a miracle that I never fell on anybody's head. Um, on the left, there was a um, bleeding heart of Jesus, um, a sacred heart of Jesus. So there's a picture of Jesus where you can see right inside, you can see this heart with a crown of thorns on it and a crucifix. And that sets the scene for the whole house. Think Carrie, the movie, right? So very, very strong Catholic roots, all going to church every single Sunday, at all the holy days of obligation and other services. But on the other side of the coin, my father had unresolved mental health issues, was extremely violent, volatile, unpredictable, probably suffering from deep depression, probably manic depression even, and um, severe anxiety. I know all these demons now. I know them from him genetically, and I know them from him transgenerationally because of what happened to me. So um, the problem for me personally was that not only was my father ruling the house with an iron fist, and my mother was so passive, she was like the eighth child. But for whatever reason, I represented some kind of trigger for him. I was singled out. I was singled out, marginalized, and treated differently than the rest of the family. I was the second youngest kid. So I had a younger sister who manipulated my father and played on the situation, weaponizing the relationship between me and my dad whenever she needed to. I mean, quite literally, I'm going to tell my dad you did this or did this when I hadn't, because she understood already that that was a weapon she could use against me. And I had five other brothers and sisters and a mother who were not doing anything to stop this from happening to me. So I was told from an early age, you're the world's worst. I never knew when he was going to hit me. When he did hit me, I had to accept it. If I cried, I got hit again for crying. I get told I'd done things that I hadn't done. And again, um, I was, it was like a Spanish Inquisition. The only answer I was supposed to give was, yes, I've done it, I'm sorry. And it just wasn't in my nature. I, I just could not stand that kind of injustice. So while all this was going on, it meant that I wasn't forming good relationships with my siblings. I wasn't forming good relationships at school. And outside, my self-esteem was on the floor. You know, I was just, it was, it was just not a good life. I haven't got any good, really good memories about it. Um, and I was treated as a second-class citizen. But the, the weird thing is, and it is ironic, is that I was actually a gifted child. So while the other children were all coming top of the class, and that's how you got love in the family, was by making sure you got top of the class. And I was going through all the things that you see with childhood PTSD. Bedwetting, nightmares, not doing well at school, right? Which any social worker or person in education would now flag as a safeguarding thing. I had a natural musical ability. I just understood music. I was very kinesthetic, which again is normally the child that gets abused is targeted for the kinesthetic nature because the abuser wants to bring their self-esteem lower than their own. But the whole process of being abused makes you even more intuitive because you're looking around at patterns trying to predict the danger, what's going to happen. So I was quite a spiritual kid when I think about it. So a few milestones now. I got to the age of 10, and I was in a folk group in the church playing guitar, and I decided to take the Michael 
out of choir boys suddenly jumped into this falsetto voice singing then sings my soul my savior lord to thee uh, a hymn that was made famous by elvis presley and the next thing you know the choir masters stopped the class who was doing that and i'm like sorry sorry miss it was me she says and, and this really is you, you couldn't write this script for a movie amy she says can you do it again i said okay so i did it again the whole place was silent she says have you got any idea about your ability to sing now the thing was that even my dad had told me i could sing but i didn't believe him because of everything else that was happening to me, I always feel quite emotional when I say this. I'm surprised I'm holding it together. I just thought my mom was telling me I could sing because my dad was so horrible to me all the time. And my dad was telling me I could sing because it was just the moment of him being nice. But no, I could reproduce anything. I could do a deep voice. I could do a high voice. So before you knew it, I'm now being auditioned by two of the top writers of choir music in Europe. And I've been told that they want me to sing in the Liverpool Catholic Cathedral Choir, now known as the Liverpool Metropolitan Cathedral. And I'm being told, your, your, you know, your musical IQ is through the roof. We've never taken on anybody your age. We normally take them on at five, but we want you. And this was a key turnaround moment for me, Amy, because what this taught me was who you are what your value is and what your strength has got nothing at all to do with accreditation, what qualifications you get, what he or she or they say about you. It's your gift from the universe, from genetics, from God, if you like. And once you start to find those talents, nobody can ever take them away from you. Nobody. And this gave me a glimpse. I was becoming empowered because I was a 10-year-old kid. My brain was about to explode, right? Because, you know, boys at that age were just about to start getting really good with maths and concepts. And I've realized that I've been sold a lie for the first 10 years of my life. I'm not the world's worst. I've got a talent, right? Then I started to mess with, um, I used to like spinning things around chains, sticks, whenever I found something, I wanted to twirl it, I wanted to feel it, I wanted to connect with it. I would feel its energy and work with it like performance art. So at 12 years of age, a man comes into my life. He's about 19 years of age at the time. He looks fantastic, six pack, like action man. My older sister's boyfriend, professional dancer. And he is the big brother that I haven't got. Because my other two brothers that were older than me, they were, let's just say they weren't as athletic as me. And, and because of the dynamics in the family, they weren't really the big brothers that some people have. This man was like my big brother and my dad all in one. He wasn't the greatest influence. You know, he was young, he used to smoke marijuana, he was homeless, all kinds of things. But for me, it meant something. And I came home one day as a 12-year-old and he'd given me a pair of nunchaku, otherwise known as nunchucks or chuckers. These were a pair of like eight to 10 inch battens, which are connected by an adjoining cord or chain. So they lend themselves to really um, flamboyant, curvaceous movements. You can spin them around. They're also an effective weapon. They were made famous by a gentleman that I'm sure your listeners will have heard of called Bruce Lee in an iconic film called Enter the Dragon. So I'd seen Bruce Lee use these. And when I came home and somebody had given me a pair, I just took the ball and run. And what used to happen, I used to come home every day. My retreat was to go into my bedroom. And rather than most people, when they learn something like nunchaku, when they learn how to use something, what they want to do is inflict their will on whatever it is they're using. I'm going to make this stick do this. I'm going to make this leg do this. I'm going to make my body do this. It's all about power, using their power to make things happen on the outside. Well, I'd learned the hard way that there are a lot of things in your life that you can't control. 
I was not loved. I was not popular. I was being beaten up by my dad. You know, I was not doing well in school. So I was interested to know, what do these nunchaku want to do? What do they want to do? How do they move? And that became a meditation, feeling them and just getting a feel for how they move. The next thing you know, I'm doing them blindfold. I'm doing two pair blindfold. I'm using my right hand and my left hand asymmetrically. I'm putting music on. So by the time I was 14 and I'd gone to a martial arts club for the first time in my life, I was already one of the best in Liverpool. So that was lesson number two. That was another talent. That was something else that made me realize, Martin, you really don't need somebody else to tell you that you're good. But there was a third pivotal moment in my childhood, and it was when I was 12. Um, you know, I'm 12, I'm becoming empowered, I'm finding my own personality. And I this thought dawned on me that my father, I didn't know how I was gonna change this situation. But if I carried on, nothing was going to change. If I carried on letting it happen, nothing was going to change. I was going to carry on being hit. I was going to carry on be, being told I was nothing. I was going to carry on being unpopular. And I came to a sort of nothing to lose moment in my mind. And I said to myself, I'm not standing for this anymore. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm not going to have it. So my mother used to go to my grandma's house certain days of the week, and it was a Sunday, and um, Sunday evening. And let's just say I'd done all my homework on a Friday to avoid any conflict. But my father came knocking on the door of my friend's house to pull me out under the guise of him wanting me to do my homework. Well, this was a crock of rubbish because my younger sister who was only about nine at the time, was nowhere to be seen. He had no idea where she was. He's bothering about me. So the trouble started as soon as we got in the house. And I turned around and said, why are you doing this to me? It's not my fault you got made redundant at Ford's. And you doing this to me is not going to make it any better. Of course, he exploded. And I ran past him. I had to fight my way past him, out the door. And I ran about a mile and a half to a friend's house. Their dad almost expected it to happen because their dad used to work with my dad. It was almost like a, a coming of age. I, I, you know, I know what he's like, sort of thing. We got in his car. He took me to my grandma's house. And my mother made a decision right there and then because we don't know what we don't know, Amy. Once we decide to take action, we don't know what that will catalyze in other people. So my mother drove us back in a taxi and she said to my dad, you're emotionally abusing our son. This was 1982. You're emotionally abusing our son. If this continues, I'm going to divorce you. It was a pivotal moment. There was only one reason you could ever get divorced in Liverpool. And you know this one, Amy. And that's if your partner says they support Man United. I've always liked that joke. Um, and for me, that was that was what brought out my warrior spirit because that was when I realized I didn't know at that time anything about gladiators and the samurai. But that's what made gladiators and the samurai so special. The gladiators got into the arena to die with honor. That meant that they could live their lives without fear and they would often survive and eventually go on to buy their freedom. The samurai already accepted that their death was inevitable, that they were going to just do what they had to do. It was their mindset. And it was no coincidence that from the age of 12, I took an increasingly strong interest in Zen Buddhism and meditation. Um, so I would say that's, that's where it really began. It, it began in the, the, my life began with the melting pot of emotional abuse, physical abuse, realizing that who I was was not who, what somebody else told me. It was what I could find inside. And that we should be fearless in life because we don't know what kind of help or support is around us until we show that we're ready for it.
And what I'm hearing, Martin, is that you found your voice several times. So you found your voice literally with your singing voice. You then found your voice to speak up again and express the truth. And you you worked out when to pick your battle and, and you drew the line at a particular point. And it was probably in coexistence with becoming that samurai warrior spirit talk about what what happened between the age of 12 and as you were saying earlier 40 where you sort of went through life and did things you didn't want to do what happened then and, and why did it suddenly find your voice again at 40 very good question and I'm wondering if you know this bit of my story Amy so I we then had like a cold war in the Morrison household right my father literally would say to my if a sibling spoke to me that would put them at odds with my dad yeah so it was full on the cold war continued but the thing was i now had my mom on my side and he only ever hit me once after that i think i was 13 and this is gonna sound terrible but I spoke to my father from that age. I spoke to my father with the sort of contempt and foul mouth that you would talk to an idiot in a pub. And it wasn't because I was a bad person. It was because I tried being nice. I'd been a loving kid. I remember my mother saying to me, why do you always forgive him? Because I used to always forgive him. And that's crazy that my mother's saying, instead of I should have been saying to her, well, why aren't you standing up for me? You know what I mean? But she was saying, why do you always forgive him? Until one day I was going to fight back. So I'd used foul language. It, it, you could cut the atmosphere between us like a knife. But I continued with my martial arts fiercely. I was their kicking man. I was their kata man. That's doing performance art forms. I was their freestyle man with, with martial arts weapons. But the thing was, I became used to operating in trauma, like in a war. The problem came for me when I got to 18. I'd won myself a scholarship. I'd won a scholarship to go down to work in an engineering firm in Staines near Middlesex. And it was such a triumph. They flew me down for interview. They flew me back. And when they flew me down for the job, they put me in a hotel for six weeks which isn't bad for an 18-year-old who was supposed to be the world's worst in 1988. But I didn't have any more drama. There was no fighting with my dad. There was no siblings. There was no mum. I was lodging in somebody's house. So I didn't know what to do. I didn't have a driving license. I didn't have a martial arts club near me. I was, I was, I was a sheep with the wolves. I turned to drink, Amy. Drink became a lifestyle. Every evening I drank. And then I turned to marijuana and I was, it's a ridiculous project to try and undertake, but I believed that if I could just be stoned all day, every day, then everything would be sorted. Get stoned, be stoned, maybe find somebody in my life who would act as a family. This is typical of PTSD, relationship addiction. Of course, I was terrible at it. By the time I was 21, I'd had a complete and utter nervous breakdown um, to the point that um, after a number of failed attempts, I kind of succeeded at killing myself one day. I was on clomipramide hydrochloride, which is a type of tricyclic antidepressant. I was drinking anything from nine to 12 pints of Guinness every evening. That was interacting with the pill and causing all kinds of problems, blackouts and all the rest of it. And this one day, I had about 10 pints. Um, I came home. I decided to take the rest of the tablets, which I did, um, about 10 days supply. I got into my bed. I put a knife to my wrist, and I cut right through. Now, the thing was, what I didn't realize was, because nobody had ever taught me, was that I hadn't actually cut the artery, but I could feel the blood. And so I'm lying there in bed, and I knew that when I say new, quote unquote new, because I wasn't, you know, what I, what I didn't know was I hadn't done it properly. It felt like this is death. I knew I was going to die. And actually I would have died, but I would have died a very painful death, death of gut rot because of the, the pills I'd taken. 
three weeks earlier, I'd taken a full bottle of sleeping pills and just woken up the next day and decided that God wanted me to live. But that euphoria died down very quickly. So I'm in bed and something extraordinary happened, Amy. In the totality of what I'd done, because I jumped off the cliff, I had killed the whole concept, the whole construct of Martin Morrison. I killed him. I killed all the worries and the anxieties, all the expectations, all the past, all the future, all the what ifs, all the feelings of failure, of being squeezed, of things not quite working out. Every scrap of it was gone. And all I was left with was this moment of peace, of tranquility, of being totally prepared to die, totally prepared to go through it. But a complete lack of desire, not a fear of, a lack of desire to die, to die because I was in a different space. I'd gone, I'd gone back to my deeper consciousness, to the root of my core being, that whatever it is that gives us our energy and our talent. And I thought, life's a video game. I can go out and do whatever I want tomorrow and it doesn't matter. If it goes wrong, I can come back to this place because you know what? Life is a terminal illness. We'll all die in the end. It doesn't have to be today. There's too much to do. And I rang the ambulance. And on the notes, it said, you know, they said, how was the patient? And it said that I was articulate and, you know, lucid. And they said reasons that he gave for doing it. And I'd said depression, repression and life. That was my answer. Never forget it. Depression, repression, and life. I never looked back. But the only problem is that we can't... Meditation teaches us to stay there, but your identity does reform. And what I didn't know at that time was that every time the identity was reborn and started to grow and mature, it still had that program that said you're the world's worst. So sooner or later, it would self-sabotage. But there was another thing that happened. Had, had I just had that breakthrough then, everything would have been fine. But there was something else happened, Amy. After I went through that complete breakdown, I came home to Liverpool. And I was going through a kind of no more Mr. Nice Guy mode. I ended my relationship that I was having. And I decided to go to Spain. I went to Spain on holiday first. realized that every single word of Spanish I'd ever heard, I could still remember and speak. And that gave me a great feeling of power to, to make people smile and to communicate. So I went back and I lived in Madrid for three months. So I come back from Spain, went home, and I remember this feeling of something not quite right. There's something going to kick off. While I'd been away, my mother had had to have an emergency hysterectomy. My father had you know, gone through it all, hadn't handled it well. And I've come home and he's picking fights with me. So that night at two o'clock in the morning, I've been out for a drink with my best friend. Everyone's celebratory. We've come home, we've gone to the attic room and we're having a drink. And I made a fatal mistake. I went to the loo first and flushed the toilet. So when my friend went to the loo five minutes later and flushed the toilet, that told everyone downstairs, the two people in the attic. My dad came upstairs to pick an argument with me and tell my mate to go. We were being really quiet. It became a heated argument and I threatened him. And then my, my friend said, look, I'll go. So my friend went. And I'll never forget this till the day I die, Amy. I was sitting in the living room. I was smoking a cigarette. And my dad, his face was in my face here. And he was shouting and bawling. And I looked at him and I said, remember, if you make my life difficult, I'm going to make your life difficult mentally and physically. And blew my smoke like I was in an Al Capone film. And he went out of the room and I was still smoking that cigarette when my mother was shouting, Martin, 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 it's your dad. I went upstairs and she said, he's, he just got into bed and ah, that was it. He, he's not breathing. 
Well, she was a trained nurse, but she was falling apart. So I went in and I did what I could. And I spent about 20 minutes trying to resuscitate him. But I didn't succeed. Now, the thing was that that left me feeling like a murderer. I felt very guilty. But I also felt strong. I felt empowered. I felt like King Kong because this man had caused me so much pain and suffering. And yet, now I was the one who was alive and he was the one who was dead. I hadn't wanted this to happen, but it just made me think, nobody's going to kill me. Yeah, I'm stronger than anything that is given to me in life. So, my 20s, My 20s were spent dealing with that alcoholism. I smoked marijuana until I reached a point where when I was high, it was 50-50 as to whether I'd feel as though the world was trying to kill me. And I would feel so paranoid that I started to worry that I could hurt somebody else. So I stopped smoking marijuana but only for that reason I carried on with the drinking until 1998 when I went to Alcoholics Anonymous and that set me off on a path of self-discovery so to bring that back up to um, when I was 40 years of age in 2009 2010 the problem I had was that I realized I wasn't Martin Morrison Alcoholics Anonymous had even helped me get over what had happened with my dad. He would have died anyway. They told me the heart attack was so severe. There was nothing anybody could have done. Um, you know, and I had tried to save him. I learned how to do CPR. I learned first aid. It took me a long time before I did, but I did it. And I ended up with three children by two different women. But this is where we go back to the trans, um, transgenerational trauma. I was so messed up, and I had this program inside me that told me that I was worthless, that it meant that I could never really commit to an ambition. I knew from the age of 30 that I wanted to be self-employed. I was teaching people one-to-one -one with martial arts. Um, I was doing a lot of training. I'd started freelance writing for people by the time, by around 2005. But I was picking the wrong women to have relationships with. They were very much almost like recapitulations of my father. And this is quite common, apparently. Repeatedly, it's as though you're trying to, I think, trying to fix it. Maybe you can just fix the relationship. Until And I was in this world of advertising where I'd started off being a bit of a superstar in telesales, but I was determined to have a company car, such a silly ambition. And that meant that I jumped into a different department. And unfortunately, I took some dead men's shoes. The thing about the organization I worked with was that there were some categories where it was about how to best process the order that was coming in from the phone call being you know, good administrative skills, upselling skills, relationship skills, which I would have been good at. But I was on a hard, cold face, cold calling role that, you know, before me, everybody had walked out from anywhere within 24 hours to six months. And that was my, my whole career was depending on doing that job. And I swear to God, I spent 15 years jumping from that one one of those kind of jobs to another within the Yorkshire Post. But I was very resilient and I got some victories, but it really, you know, and I learned a lot about PR. I learned a lot about the art of selling, the psychology of selling. 
But as I say, it got to 2009. My um, now 12-year-old kid was about one back then, or coming up for one. And um, I was still in love with his mother, or dependent, wanted to go back to her. And my best friend had lost her mother. But rather than being there for my best friend, I was poor me, poor me, every single day, poor me, poor me, poor me. And that was when this one day her dad said to me, in his strong Nigerian accent, Martin, I don't think your dad ever told you he loved you. So that was that sort of squares the circle, doesn't it? It, it, it brings it all together for you, I think, Amy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and do you have any more questions? Well, I'm just thinking. I mean, uh, suffering for sort of forty years of self sabotage, but also how I'd say oppression from the family. How does it feel now to not have that to be living with empowerment? Um, it feels as though I've got a duty to help others. I'm driven by my duty to help others. I'm driven by, I, I, I didn't want to pass this problem on to my children either. Um, I feel incredibly proud of myself. Um, and I feel as though I'm, I'm living life with purpose. You know, your podcast is all about why. I know my why. You know, I'm in touch with my God, so to speak. Um, but as you could hear, when I, doesn't matter how many times I talk about it, uh, I tried to relive somehow what happened on that night when my dad died, and I found it difficult to do. You know, it doesn't mean that I'm still there. It means that I choose to go back there and when I do and I try to relay it. Those emotions are still there. They can still come out. But I'm not a victim of those emotions anymore, Amy. I don't feel like a murderer. I don't, you know, my father, and I've forgiven my father. I love my father. My father had a lot of good qualities. He was, he could be very generous hearted. Outside of the house, he was community minded. He helped a lot of people. Unfortunately, he had terrible mental health problems. Um, okay, yes, he did single me out. And I was told by a psychologist that specializes in these matters that he would have known what he was doing when he was doing it. But I believe that in the same way that we get an urge for ice cream and then feel guilty because we've had too many calories afterwards, my father, after one of these episodes with me, I believe that he will have felt a remorse. He will have had a hangover every time. And I believe that he did his best in his own way. So everything that's happened to me is still there. I can still tap into it. I can still learn from it. And I can still use all those feelings and all those stories to help others. But I'm no longer a victim of my past. I'm driven by my purpose. I'm driven by my why. And it's so important to help everybody else to do, do the same. And how would people get in touch with you if they wanted to reach out for various different reasons, maybe the ghostwriting or one-to-one or -one sessions with you if they wanted to do some warrior work? What would they, how would they get hold of you? Okay. Well, by all means, they can follow me on LinkedIn. So if they go to LinkedIn, they'll find me as forward slash Martin J. Morrison. That's M-O-R-R-I-S-O-N, like the supermarket. So Martin J. Morrison. You can also go to my website, which isn't as updated as often as it should, to be honest, because I'm so busy. It's a case of dead men's shoes, a cobbler's shoes, sorry. But my website has got the very Trumpian name of www.martinmorrison dot me it's not that i'm a megalomaniac i just couldn't get dot co dot uk but dot me kind of suits me martin dot martin morrison dot me and they can email me at martin at martin morrison dot me so it's very easy to find me i would say though i'm i'm very active on linkedin i've i've got around 140 articles on there long form articles perfect 
And have you got some final words after? I mean, I'd just like to, firstly, I'd like to say thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing some really, you know, deep experiences that you have, you know, had in your life. And and I think it's going to be really helpful for people to to hear that and hear the, the several times that you have really gone through the battles, but come through as a strong warrior. So thank you for sharing that. Um, thank you. I've, I was just going to say, I've really enjoyed it. It was another journey for me to talk to you about it. And I just feel as though I get more of an understanding of, of, of myself and my journey and how I can help us. So I, it's it's been a very valuable experience and you're an excellent interviewer. So thank you very much, Amy. Oh, thank you. Well, have you got a final message for the audience, please, Martin? Yeah, I do. I think that what you've got to realise is that in, in all of the mainstream religions, they've all got something to say about life after death. They've all got something to say uh, about this idea of being selfless and putting other people first. And the way I see it is, whether you're religious or not, whether you're somebody who can believe in something that, they, you know, that sounds unbelievable, it doesn't matter. The moment you truly surrender to this universe, accept the fact that whether you go for it or not, yeah, nothing is going to hit you harder than life, right? So you can either continue clinging to this fear of, oh, I might get hurt. It might go wrong. I'm not going to live forever. Let all that go. Surrender it. Just surrender to life and say to yourself, what do I really want to do today? Given that, you know, like the gladiator that goes into the arena, what do I really want to give to this universe today? And I'm going to leave you with a, a you know, and, and have the bravery to do it. But there's three sentences that I say to myself every day, and I got these from the Buddhists. The first one is, it's a contemplation This three certainties. I am definitely going to die. The second certainty is, I don't know when I'm going to die. And the third one is, and you really need to get into this because it sounds negative. You have to feel it and embrace it. It could be today. How are you going to live your life fully, totally, fearlessly, with purpose? Thank you for listening to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson, and if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave me a five-star Apple podcast review. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Facebook, and become a member of my inspiring, uplifting, and positive Focus on Why Facebook group. I help people to focus on their why with clarity, uniting their passion with their purpose with a plan to create the life they truly desire. If you would like me to help you focus on your why, then please book a free 20-minute coaching call via candidly.com forward slash Amy Rowlandson. And if you haven't already, please sign up for the Friday Focus weekly newsletter via my website, amyrowlandson.com. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.